Welcome to the class of 2015. My name is Paul Mahoney. I'm the Dean of the Law School, and it's a pleasure to welcome you officially to the University of Virginia School of Law. This is the first of just two occasions when we will all gather formally as a group. The next will come in May 2015 when we will all assemble on the lawn out in front of the main entrance for your graduation. That day will arrive much more quickly than you can imagine sitting here today. The next three years will be challenging, intellectually stimulating, and even enjoyable. Legal study at its best always is, and I can say confidently that our faculty will provide you with legal education at its best. And I'm also confident in the point about enjoying your time with us. That is perhaps the most enduring and distinctive feature of the University of Virginia Law School. One of the most common phrases I hear from our graduates is, I would gladly do it all over again. They found law school a pleasure as well as an intellectual feast, and we will do our best to make it the same for you. I want to turn over the microphone briefly to our Dean of Admissions, Ann Richard. I don't have to persuade you that she did a wonderful job of selecting you <laughs> and persuading you to enroll. I know that she, no less than our faculty, will be very interested and proud to see all of your successes over the next three years and beyond. After Anne welcomes you, you will also hear briefly from Alexander Arish, the president of the Student Bar Association, our student government. Anne? On behalf of the entire admissions staff, it's my pleasure to welcome you to University of Virginia School of Law today. And I just want to introduce to you um, our directors of admissions who are here. I know some of you have dealt with, with some of us, but maybe not with all of us. So we have Cordell Falk over in the back. And Jason Dugas on the other side of the back. And on behalf of Cordell and Jason uh, and for myself, thank you so much for, for being so great through the admissions process. I know it's an anxiety-filled process, but we've really enjoyed working with you. And we're delighted that you've chosen to join us here in Charlottesville. Uh, and one uh, request, please don't forget us. Uh, if you don't know where to go with a question or a problem, if you just want to swing by and say hello, please do come by the admissions office. We'd love to follow your progress here, um, get to know you even better. This is my first year at UVA. I've just completed my first year, and I'm very, very proud of the extraordinary class that we've brought in um, this year. A couple uh, short notes about the class. You were selected from uh, more than 6,100 applications. Uh, your class uh, brings to us people from 43 states and 153 undergraduate institutions. As always, it's an incredible quality um, in terms of your academic backgrounds, professional and personal accomplishments. So again, welcome. Uh, and now we'll turn things over to Alex Arish, who is president of the Student Bar Association here at UVA Law School. Alex was representative of the UVA First Year Council. She is a member of the Virginia Sports and Entertainment Law Journal. She is uh, outreach chair for the Health Law Association. She's a member of Virginia Law Women, and she's also been a volunteer with the Domestic Violence Project. Uh, Alex and the other members of the Student Bar Association, it will be great resources for you. Thank you. Good morning. So, I've been given the impossible task of telling you how wonderful UVA Law is in only five minutes or less. So, I will do my best. Um, but first, on behalf of all the students here, I'd like to welcome you to Virginia Law. And that's not just to the next three years, but to a community that you'll belong to for the rest of your lives. Now, looking back at how I myself felt when I was sitting where you are three, uh, two years ago, not three, uh, two years ago, uh, I remember feeling proud and excited to be here, um, but also somewhat nervous about whether I'd made the right decision in coming to UVA and possibly law school in general. Um, but I think you'll find, as the rest of us have, that it very quickly becomes hard to imagine being anywhere but UVA. Now, um, I know it actually probably won't take very long for you to be tired of hearing about how amazing our law school community is, um, but it also won't take very long for you to see how true that statement is. Um, that said, law school is challenging and requires a great deal of work. 
And I have a feeling you might have heard that once, maybe more than once. You will read many legal cases and get frustrated because they don't seem to make any sense, and most of the time you'll be right. You'll spend long hours finishing up an ungraded legal research and writing paper and wondering how you could have given up an eight-hour Netflix marathon to come to law school. Um, but the people that surround you here, uh, especially your classmates, who will share all of these same experiences with you in the coming year, are what make law school here so enjoyable. UVA law students are not just intelligent and ambitious. They are incredibly supportive, and they celebrate each other's successes. And that's why the relationships that you build here are not just for the next three years. Uh, they will be some of your closest friendships and your professional ties. So when I was preparing the speech, I asked several of my classmates what law school advice they had for you. And after several recommendations for late night food places, uh, which would take far too long to list, uh, they all unanimously said, it goes by so fast. Make the most of it and get involved. And that's one thing that really sets UVA apart. Uh, students enjoy their time here. And whenever I tell uh, a non-UVA lawyer uh, that I'm a third year in law school, the response is always, oh, law school, I couldn't wait to get out of there. Um, but when I say the same thing to UVA, UVA alums, the response is always, I really miss law school. So a big part of that enjoyment uh, comes from being really involved in the student organizations and also getting to know each other outside of class. And your peer advisors um, that you'll meet later today are an excellent resource about how to get involved, uh, as well as the law school website, which lists all the student organizations and also things to do in Charlottesville. Um, now, in the few weeks, there will also be an activities fair for you to get um, more acquainted with the student organizations. Um, so there's lots, lots to come in, in terms of how to get involved. Finally, I'd also like to give you an idea of what the SBA does and how you can be a part of it. As the law school student government, the SBA is really the voice of students in all types of matters that can come up. And I'll mention that one of the best things about my role as president so far has also been seeing how supportive and dedicated the administration is to its students. The SBA also organizes school-wide events, helps all the other student organizations with their needs, and works to improve various aspects of student life. <coughs> You'll soon get more information about joining the SBA committees, first year council, and being an SBA representative. I also wanted you to be familiar with the other three people on our SBA executive board, Vice President Megan Kao, Secretary Jackie Werman, and Treasurer Mariah Johnston. Having said that, I have a feeling that you might not remember everything you hear today, or even what I've said. Um, so if you have any questions already, please feel free to email me or stop by the SBA office in Slaughter Hall. Um, we're excited that you're here and to see where law school takes you. Welcome to UVA. Tomorrow you will have the opportunity to meet several of our administrative <coughs> professionals who will help to make your transition to law school easier. For now, I'd just like to identify Martha Ballinger, who is standing right in the back there. Uh, she is our Dean of Students. And along with your peer advisors, she is a wonderful source of information about all aspects of student life and is also ready to assist you if you should run into any problems, be they academic or personal. Anne highlighted a few of the numerical indicators of your brilliance. Uh, but your choice to come to Virginia, just like our choice to admit you, was not simply a matter of numbers. Most of you attended one of our student uh, open houses and realize that Virginia is a unique place. Our students have always been distinguished by a remarkable combination of interpersonal and intellectual skill. I'm reminded of the importance of that combination every year around this time when employers come here to grounds to interview our students. They routinely report that while newly minted graduates of all the best law schools excel at the intellectual challenges of legal practice, Virginia graduates tend to be better prepared for the daily interactions with colleagues, clients, and other lawyers that are equally important to a successful career. Those are skills that our students develop and hone as they engage with their peers and their professors in this unusually collegial community. 
I urge you to embark on this academic challenge, but not to ignore or forget the other things that are important to you, your family and friends, your pastimes, your extracurricular activities. Get involved in a few of the many activities that your fellow <coughs> students organize. I also urge you to get to know our faculty. One of the reasons that they are here rather than somewhere else is that they genuinely enjoy teaching and interacting with their students, and I think you will find those interactions quite valuable uh, as well. Your membership in this community will last a lifetime. There is perhaps no greater measure of the affection our alumni feel for the law school than their eagerness to help you succeed. Our graduates invest their time in the law school as adjunct instructors, moot court judges, uh, and guest speakers. They also provide unmatched financial generosity to defray the cost of your education. My primary function today is to introduce our speaker, Rebecca Vallis, but I'd also like to share a few observations about the experience ahead of you. That experience will be transformative. Indeed, the way you analyze information will undergo such a profound change that in a few short months you will find it difficult to remember how you used to think before you arrived here at Virginia Law. You have come here to study the law. What does that mean? A simple meaning of the term law is a rule, like the rules of the game. So here's a legal rule. Article 1, Section 6 of the U.S. Constitution, the so-called Emoluments Clause, provides that no one who has been a member of Congress may, during his or her term of office, be appointed to any federal office, quote, which shall have been created, or the emoluments whereof shall have been increased during such time, close quote. So if the president were to appoint a sitting senator to the Supreme Court, and the salaries of the justices had been increased during the senator's term of office, the appointment would violate the text of the Emoluments Clause. And to the layperson, which until 15 minutes ago included you, <laughs> that's what law is all about. It's a rule book, and the point of studying law is to learn the rules. Indeed, Napoleon famously attempted to set down in one place all of the rules that would govern any possible dispute so that one simply had to turn to the right page of the rule book and find the answer. He failed in, in that uh, <laughs> task as he did in a few of his other projects. <laughs> um, beginning Wednesday, though, you will discover that most of the legal questions that you will encounter in law school and in your careers fall in the gaps that no rule covers explicitly. There, the rules that exist, that exist are used as premises, analogies, or examples. They're tools that a lawyer uses to construct an argument that will persuade a listener as to the correct answer to the present question. Moreover, even when there is a rule that is directly on point, the lawyer's task, more often than not, is to find a way to an accomplish an objective without violating the rule. Thus, U.S. presidents have appointed many members of Congress to, the, uh, to federal offices, the salaries of which had been increased during their time in Congress, the most recent example being Hillary Clinton's appointment as Secretary of State. So how did they do that? They did it by issuing an executive order that most recently froze the Secretary of State's salary at its uh, level prior to the time Mrs. Clinton was elected to the Senate. Is this okay? Well, lawyers have persuaded presidents from William Howard Taft to Barack Obama that it works. Now, the Supreme Court has never decided the issue, and views differ, uh, thus leading to a law review article with one of my all-time favorite titles, is Lloyd Benson unconstitutional? <laughs> One of a lawyer's primary tasks is to persuade. And the great skill that lawyers possess that facilitates persuasion is the ability to reason with clarity, consistency, and precision. We call that skill thinking like a lawyer. And acquiring it will be the primary task of the coming year. Having learned to think like a lawyer, you will put that skill to work in subsequent years as you study a variety of different substantive areas of law. 
But without the tools of analysis that you will acquire this year, the raw material of legal rules would be of no use to you. On TV and in the movies, law is a zero-sum game in which one party wins and the other loses. But in the real world, most interactions are not zero-sum, and persuasion is usually not a matter of overwhelming the other side with your brilliance, but of understanding the other party's objectives and figuring out how to achieve them and your client's objectives simultaneously. A great lawyer is a problem solver as well as a persuader. Our speaker today, Rebecca Vallis, embodies these as well as another central virtue of a great lawyer. That is the realization that law is a profession of service, whether your clients are criminal defendants, victims of domestic violence, or businesses. Rebecca's entire career and indeed entire life have been devoted to serving <coughs> others. She is a 2009 graduate of the law school, and my faculty colleagues and I remember her time here with great fondness. She was president of the Public Interest Law Association, put in more hours of pro bono service than any member of her graduating class, and won our most prestigious graduation award, uh, along with many other distinctions uh, too numerous to list. Lest this sound like the resume of the, stereo of the stereotypical head in the clouds public interest do-gooder, uh, Rebecca also has a hard-headed practical understanding of the world around her. She immediately understood the impact that the 2008 financial crisis would have on funding for public interest organizations and moved quickly and effectively to put PILA on a sound financial footing. Shortly before graduation, she received a prestigious Skadden Fellowship enabling her to begin her career at Community Legal Services of Philadelphia where she is now a staff attorney. She remains focused on serving low-income clients with a particular focus on the elderly. She was uh, a member of the inaugural Forbes uh, 30 Under 30 in Law and Policy. And I assure you that any advice she has for you is well worth hearing. Please join me in welcoming Rebecca Valls. I was hoping the 30 under 30 thing wasn't going to come up, um, but I'm also a member of the under 5-6 club, so I have to move the microphone down. Can people hear me? Is that a yes? I hear, I've got thumbs up in the back. All right, great. Um, so good morning. morning. That kind of sucked. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you. All right. So first off, um, I need to thank Dean Mahoney for having me here today. Um, most speakers who deliver remarks at orientation, I think, are supposed to tell some sort of funny story about Dean Mahoney. Um, I'm not going to do that today because I, I like him, and he actually stole the story I was going to tell, which was that when I was a third-year student, um, my first encounter with him was really going and having a, a conversation. I was terrified, right, because he's the new dean. Um, went into his office to have a conversation about funding public interest summer fellowships. Um, and I found that he was the warmest, kindest individual with a, a heart of gold who really cared deeply um, about making sure that we had adequate funding. So the reason that we were able to put PILA on sound footing was actually mostly thanks to him um, and making sure that the Law School Foundation was going to fund more fellowships than it ever had in, in the law school's history. So that's my not funny but really warm and fond memory of Dean Mahoney. I should also thank Jason Trujillo, who's been driving me around since I got here yesterday. Um, my mom likes to say that my biggest act of public service is staying off the roads, so. <laughs> I don't own a car in Philly, and it's mostly because I don't need one, but it's also better off that way. Um, so, and I also wanted to just say uh, thank you to um, Dean Ballinger, and I miss her desperately. She was like my fourth or fifth mother in law school. Um, so I do a lot of public speaking. Um, I've testified before Congress. I've delivered two and three hour and five hour and six hour trainings to lawyers um, and to 500 at a time and you know a thousand more on simulcast. Um, I've been featured on TV news, I've been on NPR, but when Dean Mahoney asked if I would come and speak to you today, I realized I'd never really given a speech speech. So I decided I was going to do a little bit of research. I started by thinking back to all of the orientation speeches that I had ever heard. 
um, you know, middle school, high school, college, law school. And I realized they all had one thing in common. I couldn't remember any of them. And while that might provide a little bit of consolation to a person standing in my shoes today, it didn't really help me out in my goal. So that having failed somewhat miserably, I decided to try a different tack. Thinking back to the most memorable speeches that I'd heard, because those must surely have something to offer in terms of guidance. The first memorable speech that came to mind was from just a few months ago at a fundraiser for my organization. Now this particular fundraiser is called, with predictable kitsch, the Breakfast of Champions. So to set the scene, um, it's about 200 people seated around uh, kind of circular conference tables in a, uh, a hotel conference room while we sip lukewarm coffee and eat lukewarm eggs and try not to chew too much. Um, and after about an hour and a half of lots and lots of people having just a few brief remarks, um, it was finally time for the keynote speaker. This year, the keynote was to be delivered by a particularly nondescript state official, um, our state treasurer. I should really say Commonwealth Treasurer, having lived in three Commonwealths, I should know better. Um, and he started off by rattling off some facts and figures from Jacob Stiglitz's latest book on income inequality um, and the impact that it can have on a nation's economic health. And then he sort of switched course unexpectedly and he seized on the fact that the US, my God, happens to trail France in upward economic mobility. He just couldn't get his head around the fact that America this great America, the home of the American dream, could possibly trail France on that metric. So as he put it, and this is where the, the speech really veered off and became memorable, that's like France trailing behind the US in cheese production, or wine consumption, or afternoon sex. <laughs> So I don't think Dean Mahoney asked me here today to talk about afternoon sex. Um, I think he asked me here to talk about law school, not to say the two need to be mutually exclusive. Um, so that speech wasn't really going to help me either, unfortunately. Finally, and more helpfully, I was reminded of a speech um, by Florence Roisman, a particularly influential and inspirational figure in the field that I work in, anti-poverty advocacy. Um, she addressed a group of legal aid and anti-poverty advocates in 2008 in a speech that really resonated with me. And the topic was principles for effective advocacy. Now, the words that she delivered really resonated with me, though, on another level, which was sort of more words to live by, um, and I thought I wanted to share them with you today. Um, the principles that she offered were think big, be greedy, be creative, be unreasonable, and be strategic. I'll start with thinking big. In the spirit of full disclosure, something you may have noticed by now is that I'm not all that long out of law school. The class of 09 part of that overly generous introduction was probably a pretty big giveaway. But when Dean Mahoney called me and asked if I would speak to you today, um, I, I assumed he was hoping I would speak with a new admitted student or maybe a, a recent graduate who was hoping to talk about a career in public interest work. Um, and instead, when he asked if I would speak at orientation, I was admittedly both stunned and a little bit confused. Um, but after thinking some more about why he might want someone like me to speak to you folks at an event like orientation, I realized it probably had something to do with the very fact that I'm not that long out of law school. I arrived in Charlottesville in August 2006, equal parts idealistic, exhilarated, and terrified. Against my better judgment, you see, I'd just read Scott Turow's epic novel, One Out, and watched The Paper Chase, and was bracing for a showdown with a UVA incarnation of the infamous Professor Kingsfield. Now, let me be the first to assure you, as a side note here, that while many of the professors can verge on intimidating, if not um, scary, in the classroom from time to time, none of them ever told me to take a dime, call my mother, and tell her there's serious doubt about my ever becoming a lawyer. <laughs> In addition, however, while sitting in uh, my seat in orientation, somewhere right over there, um, I was itching to save the world. Did I know precisely how I was going to do this? No. You know, as an avid Washington Post reader and Sunday talk show watcher and all-around political junkie, I figured it was going to look something like starting my career in Washington and modeling myself in the image of one of the characters from the West Wing. 
but that was about all I really thought through. Um, after a semester of coursework, I became clued into the fact that contrary to popular opinion, public interest jobs weren't so easy to get straight out of law school. More than a few well-intentioned friends and loved ones and even law school classmates advised me to think about taking a clerkship or maybe trying to get a position in a law firm um, because that would be the safer, more sensible, more certain path. And that later I could move into a career in public interest once I had my, you know, a few years of legal practice under my belt and was on more sound financial footing. Now, for anyone who knows me, it won't come as much of a surprise that each and every such conversation had the exact opposite effect on me. That was not why I had gone to law school, I protested. It wasn't part of my vision of what I wanted to do. Which brings me to the first, and perhaps also fourth, of Professor Roisman's guiding principles. Think big and be unreasonable. <laughs> For every instance on which I was told it was impossible to get a job doing public interest work straight out of law school, I became all the more stubbornly determined that that was what I was going to do. It was just a matter of how. One of the best pieces of advice I got when I was in law school was, in the, was from the Public Service Center. And I was actually just reminded of it by a good friend of mine and a, an inspirational lawyer herself, Amy Woolard, um, class of 2008. That advice was, find people doing work that interests you, Go talk to them, find out more about what they do, and find out how they got where they are. So I started with the folks at the Legal Aid Justice Center in Charlottesville. As far as I could tell, they seemed like pretty cool people. And they were involved in really interesting, ambitious causes, like taking on predatory lenders who peddled payday loans, and representing low-wage workers who'd been wrongfully terminated by sleazy employers, and uh, advocating for people with mental illness who are facing really terrible conditions in mental institutions, to name just a few. Also, um, perhaps importantly, their director, Alex Gulata, was a loud and pretty rambunctious guy with crazy hair and a penchant for cursing. So I figured, you know, these people seem pretty cool. I should go figure out more about this legal aid thing. So after talking to the folks at LAJC, I ended up spending my summer between 1L and 2L years at Greater Boston Legal Services, a large legal aid program doing similarly cool work to LAJC. And I fell in love. <laughs> Nuns refer to getting the call, and often people in legal aid refer to getting bitten by the bug. Whatever you call it, something clicked in me, and I realized this is what I wanted to do. Work directly with low-income individuals and families whose lives I could really have a direct impact on for the better, and combine that direct representation with broader policy advocacy and systems reform. This was the model espoused by programs like LAJC and GBLS, and also the program I would eventually join after law school. So now, now that I knew what I wanted to do, I just had to figure out how I was going to get there, right? So if my chances were reportedly slim that I was going to get a job straight out of law school doing this thing that I now had my heart set on, I decided I needed to get creative and strategic. So I did a lot more talking to the people doing legal aid work to figure out how they'd gotten where they were. And again and again and again, the word fellowship kept coming up. The ticket to getting the gig I wanted, it seemed, was to win a fellowship and build my own project at an organization doing legal aid work. I won't speak at length about this part of my story because this isn't a talk about fellowships. I give enough of those. Um, but for any of you taking notes who are possibly interested in doing public interest work, um, I would head straight to the Public Service Center and ask them about fellowships. And I would also invite you to contact me personally because I love a uh, few things more than talking to people about getting fellowships. For the next two years, I set, us up, I set about preparing myself as much as humanly possible for a career in public interest law and specifically in legal aid. I took as many law school clinics as Carrie Bennett would allow, actually more, but it took some arm wrestling, although I promised I would never tell him I beat him in that. I spent my second summer doing legal aid work in Philadelphia. Um, I took all the public interest and poverty related coursework I could find, and I availed myself of the opportunity to do tons of pro bono work, and I became heavily involved with PILA, the Public Interest Law Association. In a recent Fresh Air interview, I heard Rachel Maddow refer to her, uh, to landing her spot on MSNBC as winning the job lottery. Well, for me, getting a Skadden Fellowship was like winning the job lottery. Effectively, I got a law firm to fund a job that I designed at an organization doing exactly the kind of work I wanted to be part of for two whole years. It was truly everything I'd hoped. 
I got to represent individual clients in hearings and in court. I got to take what I saw on the ground and channel it into broader systemic advocacy on the local, state, and national levels with federal agencies, with Congress, with the White House. And I became part of an inspiring and close-knit network of Skadden Fellows around the country. And most importantly, I got to be part of the team at Community Legal Services, a bunch of smart as hell, dynamic, and passionate advocates and lawyers from whom I still learn a tremendous amount every single day. So happily ever after, right? Not so much. Many of you may be familiar with the current state of the legal um, uh, job situation and the economy and the job climate generally. Um, legal aid programs, like many other sectors of the legal field, have taken a real hit in the economic downturn. So it dawned on me that my program was likely in no position to hire me and keep me on after my fellowship funding ran out. So it was time to get creative and strategic once again. I scouted out another kind of funding for young lawyers, a different kind of fellowship that would permit me to once again design my own job and receive funding to work for a legal aid organization. And thankfully, that funding came through. And pretty soon after that funding did come through, buying me another year with my program to continue doing the work that I'd been doing with folks who were elderly and disabled, CLS finally broke down and gave me a permanent job. I guess they'd realized I would just keep showing up, and eventually they'd have to move me down into the basement where I might start muttering about my, my uh, missing red stapler. <laughs> so here I am in my dream job after having weathered several years of uncertainty, anxiety, and admittedly at times downright fear. The takeaway I see from the series of events that constitute my professional life thus far is that focusing your mind on the goal at hand rather than on the supposedly long odds of achieving it is what ends with getting what you want. No matter how competitive the applicant pool for a certain job or fellowship or clerkship may be, somebody is going to get the position. So why not make it you? You already have at least some proof that this is good advice because despite the 15% or 10%, I was trying to do the math before, however low the acceptance rate is at UVA these days, you applied and now you find yourself sitting here preparing for your first day of class. In a recent, a recent commencement address at the University of Portland, the environmentalist and author Paul Hawken put this much better than I possibly could. He said, don't be put off by people who know what is not possible. Do what needs to be done and check to see if it was impossible only after you are done. Put differently in the context of the law school experience and of the process of goal setting, the best way not to get the position you want is not to apply for it. Be greedy may be the least predictable part of Florence Roisman's advice, but in the context of preparing for law school, as well as the stuff that comes after, I think it's one of the most important. Even before you arrived in Charlottesville, you probably already felt pressure from someone in your life, maybe multiple someones, about what classes you should take, whether you should join a law journal, and probably, most likely, what you should do after you graduate. For those of you who haven't already felt this sort of pressure, trust me, you will. Maybe from mom or dad or grandpa, maybe your former boss at that law firm where you were a paralegal and who wrote you a really great recommendation for your law school applications. Whoever you hear it from, what I can tell you for sure is that this is your law school experience. And on the other side of the bar exam, which I will not talk about today because none of you should be giving it any thought whatsoever until spring of 2015, trust me on that, um, what, what follows is, after that is your professional life. It's not mom or boss or grandpa or your 1L section mates even who are going to be putting in the hours at the job that you eventually take. So why should you let any of them tell you what your goals are or what they should be? This may sound like common sense. You may be sitting there thinking, this girl is telling me some crazy things. Of course, it's my choice. I would never let anyone influence me in what I do in law school or afterward. But more than you can possibly grasp right now from where you're sitting, for most, the experience of law school is truly a transformative one. And don't get me wrong, this transformation can be very much for the good. It can involve tremendous intellectual growth, the development of critical thinking, and other valuable skills, among a lot else. But it can also involve an unintentional realignment of your values, goals, and dreams. So my advice is to think hard about what brought you here. 
You're about to spend three pretty intense, pretty wonderful, but pretty intense years. Reading, a lot of reading, <laughs> thinking, writing, I won't even mention outlining, you already know about that, and generally pushing yourself beyond the level of academic focus that was sufficient in your previous endeavors. So I would urge you throughout that whole process to think about and keep in mind why you came here and not to let other people tell you what your dreams should be along the way. Now switching gears briefly, it's a little known fact that buried deep in the famous UVA honor code is a requirement that all persons invited to deliver remarks on grounds must pay homage to Thomas Jefferson. So before I offer any actual concrete advice about law school, I think I would probably be remiss if I didn't follow suit. But rather than tell you about uh, how he read laws instead of having formal schooling or how he was a commercial litigator for seven years before he answered the famous call of public service, I will instead offer you a piece of practical advice that frankly I wish someone had given me before I started law school and moved to Charlottesville. For all you wine drinkers out there, stay far away from any wine produced by the famous Norton grape. <laughs> As you'll soon be fond of saying, reasonable minds could differ about this one, but in my humble opinion, as much of a Renaissance man as old TJ may have been, he was a total failure at viticulture. <laughs> so now for that part of my remarks that are the unsolicited concrete advice about law school. Take a wide variety of classes, including ones and especially ones on topics that you have no exposure to prior to now. And as I noted before, please, with zero regard to what you think is going to be on the bar exam, I have a good friend who actually stumbled into her dream job because she took a tax class on a whim. You never know. Get to know your professors. One of the things that makes UVA so special is that the professors are not just warm, but they're incredibly accessible. They really do love to teach, but they also love the stuff that happens in between, after, and before class. Some of the people I was closest to in law school and with whom I still keep in close touch and who I count as my most significant mentors were my law school professors. So take them to lunch, enroll in their third year small group seminars, visit their office hours, create an independent study or directed research under their guidance. You'll be glad that you did. Make good use of your summers. The summer internship experiences in between your first and second and second and third year in, in law school are among the best opportunities to really test drive potential employers, potential positions, and areas of practice. I would encourage you to make the most of them, not just because they result in job offers, hopefully, but also because they're excellent experiences and help you figure out what you want to do. Take advantage of clinics. I cannot overstate how valuable the clinic experience is, no matter what you're interested in doing after law school. Clinics provide a space to take the substantive law and the legal uh, tools and the critical thinking strategies that you learn in the classroom and apply them to real live legal questions and to, to help people who actually do need legal help. Um, some of my most memorable and meaningful law school experiences actually came out of clinics, representing a family who was at risk of losing their food stamps because mom had been selling her platelets at a blood bank so that she could pay the rent, uh, advocating for a young man with severe mental illness to be admitted to a supportive group home living arrangement so he could live in the community um, instead of in a mental institution. On the other hand, clinics also offer another valuable opportunity, which is one to make mistakes. I will never forget my first trial, which took place under supervision in the housing clinic. I feel like you can tell what's coming. Um, my, clinic, my client was facing eviction from her apartment because of water damage that the landlord blamed on her, said that it had been uh, her fault through negligence. Um, I showed and, and that, that water had been spilling out of the bathtub. So I showed large, snazzy, blown up photos of this immense shower curtain that my client had installed in her shower, um, heavily waterproof, heavy duty, and I thought, you know, uh, um, indisputable evidence that she had taken far more than reasonable steps to keep water inside the shower area. This would surely win the case, I thought. However, that's not exactly what happened. Um, during cross, the landlord's attorney asked my client, was this the same shower curtain that had been in place while the water uh, damage occurred? And my client, without missing a beat, says, oh no, 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 I put that up after all the water damage since this one wasn't doing a good job. So 
right, not a, not a good moment as the attorney of record. Um, thankfully, I did still manage to keep her from being evicted, but in the process, I learned a valuable lesson, which is to ask your clients especially the obvious questions before you put them on the stand. Um, another piece of advice that has really uh, been important for me is to make exercise part of your routine. I'm a runner, um, and my morning run was a huge part of why I stayed sane throughout law school. Um, similarly, I would encourage you to get enough sleep. All-nighters are not going to help you either in the classroom or in your four, six, or eight-hour written exams. And finally, and most importantly, the biggest mistake that you can make during law school and afterward is forgetting to have fun. Frankly, I think have fun is the missing piece from Florence Roisman's advice. So to that end, get the heck off of North Grounds as soon as you're done with this stuff and explore what Charlottesville has going on. It may seem like a small town, but it actually has a ton to offer. Go out to eat. There are a lot of fantastic restaurants. Catch some live music. Go to a wine tasting, not the Norton Group, um, on the downtown mall. Uh, visit a brewery if you're a craft beer nut like I am. Go for a hike or a run on the Ravana Trail. Um, and even when you do stay on North Grounds, the law school itself has a ton to offer. Um, join clubs that interest you. Put in a plug for the Public Interest Law Association, among many other fabulous ones. Um, compete in the Public Interest Law Association's annual beer pong tournament. Yes, they do that. Um, go to the libel show. Be in the libel show. You'll, you'll find out soon enough what that is. Play softball. Also, it's okay if you're not good at softball. <laughs> I may be addicted to watching baseball, but I cannot catch or throw to save my life, and that's just fine. Um, and finally, um, try to read one chapter a night of a book before you fall asleep. Um, it's good for the soul not to have the last words that you read be collateral estoppel before you fall asleep. <laughs> so I'll close on this theme, the importance of having fun, because I think that's the most important thing of all. Pretty much no matter what you end up doing with your law degree, you're going to work a lot, more than almost anything else you do for the rest of your life. So like those mattress commercials that tell you that you need to choose a mattress that suits you really well because of the importance of a good night's sleep, choosing a job and a career that you really, truly, and passionately enjoy is the trick to being happy and to avoiding the burnout that has produced so many of our nation's beloved second career crime novelists. As Rachel Maddow put it in that same Fresh Air interview, as she sees it, she gets paid to show up and have a hell of a lot of fun. I feel incredibly lucky to be able to say, in all honesty, that I feel the same way about my job. And I wish the same for all of you, whatever form that takes. Thank you.